Welcome to the Jacob Kersey program. I am Jacob Kersey at Real Jacob Kersey on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can connect with me there, and uh, you can find that handle in the show notes. I want to welcome you to this episode. We're going to be talking about gender ideology, uh, which was really big in the news back in March uh, due to uh, Leah Thomas, who is a biological male um, that competed in a women's sports uh, women's swim sports team for the uh, NCAA championship for a 500 yard freestyle event um, Leah Thomas originally went by Will when uh, he considered himself a biological male and uh, was an average swimmer ranked, uh, ranked number 462 in the nation then he decided he was actually a woman and took a few months of hormonal suppressants to, to prove it now, the biological women that worked tirelessly for years to get to that point where they could compete for that NCAA, NCAA championship title were denied the opportunity when um, Leah Thomas, formerly Will Thomas, decided to transition to a woman. Now, gender ideology has spread to nearly every aspect of our lives. Education, religion, government, and now sports. So it's kind of hard to not address it and to not have to deal with it. And so Dr. Jay Richards is the director of DeVos Center for Liberty or Life, Religion, and Family and the William E. Simon Senior Research Fellow in Religious Liberty and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. And uh, it's just a privilege to have him on. Jay, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks. So I want to start off by just kind of defining some terms so people kind of understand what mm -hmm. we're talking about. So the first thing, yeah. I mentioned gender ideology that's uh, affecting us in every aspect of our life. Can you define what that is? Yeah, think of gender ideology as a, 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 this philosophical worldview that attempts to replace the idea of biological sex. That is the reality of mammalian biology, humans as male and female with an entirely subjective idea of gender identity. So people will hear gender identity and think that corresponds to male or female, but in fact, it's entirely independent of biological sex. So if you sort of, the, the idea um, is that you <laughs> essentially um, have to ask someone, you can't look at someone's body or their facial features and tell if they're male or female, you have to ask them what their gender identity is. That That's the basic idea of gender ideology. Yeah, so a lot of people, when, when we're discussing this issue, I think there's some confusion. A lot of people will say, well, there's only two sexes or there's only two genders. And other people will say, well, sex and gender are not the same thing. Uh, can you kind of help people clear up the waters? What's the difference between yeah. sex and gender? Well, at least originally, these were roughly synonyms. So if you look, you know, there's for hundreds of years, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, gender was sort of the kind of a polite synonym for sex because sex can refer both to our biological difference between male and female, but it can also refer to the sex act. So sometimes people would say gender as a kind of polite way of referring to the same thing. Gender is also used in languages. E English doesn't have much of this, but of course the Latin languages have masculine and feminine and neuter endings and things like that. The, I think the, here's the easiest way to think of it is that sex is a biological reality Gender is the kind of social manifestation of that uh, linked to our sex. So sex is male and female. Gender is masculine and feminine. But here's what happened is that though they started out as roughly as synonyms, uh, over the last 25 years or so, the word sex has dropped out of the language so that if you look at a medical form or an application, you almost never see sex now in the doctor's office, you'll see gender. And so that was the initial switch is start using the word gender exclusively, initially to refer to sex, and it's useful because people will assume that's what it refers to. But then what happened is that an entirely new way of thinking about these things came in and was plugged in so that gender actually doesn't refer to sex. What it refers to is this subjective idea of gender identity. And so that's why at this point, the word gender ends up being a problem because unless you really specify what you mean, it's likely that what people are talking about is really this internal notion of gender identity. And so that's why we, you know, we advise people when the, you know, congressmen and congressmen, women, when they're writing laws, use the word sex. In fact, you don't really even need to say, we sometimes will clarify and say biological sex, but of course the word sex 
it presupposes <laughs> biology, and that's why it, male it, to refer to someone as male. Though what that means is that they are, you know, a, a, a particular member of the um, mammalian species that produces large gametes. That's that's literally what it means. And so, a part of recovering from this crazy idea of gender ideology is re-anchoring our language in human nature and in, in biological reality. I think that's very interesting how, how you mentioned that, you know, there was this idea of sh shying away from saying biological sex and only talking about gender. So what do you say to the people who say, well, here's the thing. I want you to just ignore my biological sex and only define me and treat me by the gender that I choose. Ignore my biology for my psychology. Well, and so that would be a really clear way of putting it, except most folks in the gender ideology camp – they, they actually deny that there is a biological sex. What they will mm -hmm. say is that there's sex assigned at birth, which is a different thing. And so this is the hard thing is that maybe, you know, about 2015, you'd still get some of the activists that talked about the difference between biological sex and gender identity. But that is inconsistent with the ideology. And so that's why they now refer to sex assigned at birth. In other words, there isn't this independent fact about them that's male or female it might be that the doctor guessed and decided they were a boy when this person was born but it's really up to the person to decide uh what they are and this is their sort of internal gender identity but that's exactly what's happened you know the example that you gave of of uh will slash leah thomas is that okay why do we separate male and female sports in college well the reason is because it's the only way to do this fairly. If women are going to compete at the college level, they should be competing against each other because men have, on average, significant physical advantages over women. And so if we were all competing in the same league, the fastest high school males would beat the lead Olympian uh, record-winning females. That's how much the disparity is. And so we separate people between male and female, the two, two uh, sort of leagues in sports, because of biological sex. It has nothing whatsoever to do with people's uh, internal sense of gender. And in fact, I don't even really think gender identity, I don't even think it's a real thing because if you I press people on how they define it, either they're gonna say, well, it's my understanding of my sex, in which case, okay, well now it's anchored in sex. Or they'll say, well, gender identity is your internal sense of gender. Well, in that case, they're using the word gender in both the term being defined and the definition. So it's entirely circular. And so it's just sort of what anybody says it is. And so I just, you know, I, I don't concede the idea that gender identity uh, is even re even a real thing. It's not that I have a male gender identity. It's that I, I know I'm a man, you know, that, that, and there's not really anything else to it. And so most people, what's happening is that gender ideology has worked its way into our school system and works its way all the way down even into kindergarten level curricula. And the mm. purpose of that is to help, really to help, I shouldn't say that, it's to cause children not to form these basic categories that they would otherwise form, which is that you observe some people are boys and some people are girls. Instead, they wanna say, no, you can't judge in that way. What you'd have to do is you have to ask people for their gender identity. You, they're introducing the terms and the kind of conceptual categories of gender ideology when they do that. And I think a lot of people don't quite understand that that's actually what's happening. Yeah, so you mentioned how this uh, agenda has started to work its way down all the way to children, kindergarten age. Uh, these trans activists are trying to teach children and are encouraging uh, unhealthy decisions at, uh, at a very young age. Uh, some of these uh, push for sterilized sterilizing chemical and surgical transition interventions for minors who are dealing with this gender dysphoria. Uh, some of this also includes like puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, surgeries that remove healthy genitalia, all this being pushed at, at a very, very young age. And th there are numerous stories out there. Perhaps you might have uh, some to share with the audience of where this has taken place, but parents are being told that puberty blockers Mm -hmm. And cross-sex hormones may be the only way to prevent their children from committing suicide. So why are these – why are the things that these trans activists are teaching these children, why are they so dangerous? 
Well, they're dangerous. You said it. Um, th this is called the Dutch Protocol. It's based on a single study that the Netherlands did with 54 subjects and no control group. Um, and basically, they were testing whether this uh, really dramatic response to gender dysphoria. So you take a child that has struggles with his or her biological sex, you know, they have, are alienated for some reason from their sexed body, and then you set them on the path of transition. And it starts with so-called social transition, where you just treat them according to their uh, their supposed gender identity, and you call them by the, the pronouns they want. That's social transition. Then puberty blockers, if they haven't started puberty, followed by cross-sex hormones, followed by surgical intervention. Well, this is, if you think about it, this is putting kids on the pathway to sterilization because the outcome of the transition surgery for, for women, that's gonna be double mastectomy and hysterectomy. And for men, it's gonna be castration. So you're going to make them sterile. In fact, the cross-sex hormones alone, if they go on too long, can actually sterilize children. So that's what's at stake. It's not just the fairness of high school and college sports, it's whether as children, we're going to allow medical practitioners and school counselors and pediatricians to put kids on a sterilization pathway, especially when, one, we know that if you don't do that, the vast majority of kids actually grow out of it. Puberty for most kids actually helps cure them of gender dysphoria. And two, we don't even have any evidence that this procedure actually helps with the thing it's supposed to help with. In other words, does it actually reduce the incidence of suicide. There is absolutely no evidence of that. And in fact, I have a colleague at Heritage that's just about to release a detailed statistical study showing that in places and states where kids can get these transition procedures, they are more likely to commit suicide and then states where they can't do it. And so that's all, but it's based on lies about the actual effects of the procedure. Uh, and so that parents, they, parents basically get blackmailed. They're, t they're told, well, do you want a dead son or a live daughter? The alternative to you doing this would be your child committing suicide. Well, of course, most parents, if they think that's the only choice, uh, will, will relent. But parents need to, to be, need to be told that this just simply isn't true. Wow. So how, how are doctors just getting away with telling parents that, hey, this is the only way to prevent your child from committing suicide? When you, when you stated that the opposite is actually true. In fact, suicide rates go up after these transitions. Yeah, well, they get away with it because so many of our institutions have been infiltrated by gender activists and ideologues over the years. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, for instance, uh, they didn't poll all pediatricians, but this, they set up a self-selected committee to develop their guidelines on this. And the American Academy of Pediatrics says this is the standard of care. We now have, as of two weeks ago, the Department of Health and Human Services under President Biden uh, has now endorsed that what I just called the Dutch protocol, that four step pathway, that's called gender affirming care. And in fact, the uh, the Biden administration actually sent all state attorneys general a letter uh, two weeks ago, um, essentially threatening them and saying, look, if you don't allow kids to have access to, quote, gender affirming care, or as we know, this pathway to sterilization, you could be violating their civil rights. And so you've got the federal government. You have self-selected medical organizations. And so a lot of doctors, they don't speak out about this because they're afraid that they'll lose their medical license. Now they're afraid they could actually get charged in some places uh, with a crime, at least according to the federal government. And then the good news is that we have states that are actually starting to push back. So Florida and Alabama and Arkansas are actually, um, they're pushing back against this movement. But what people have got to understand is that the institutions you might naturally have trusted, including medical organizations, uh, uh, therapeutic organizations, school counselors, uh, pediatricians, you need to do your homework. There's a lot of great uh, pediatricians that if you ask them privately, will do the right thing. But lots of them are scared, and some of them, frankly, are, are now committed activists on behalf of this ideology. So, Jay, you mentioned uh, states are starting to enact legislation that, that kind of address this issue, but there also has been legislation up in Washington, D.C. recently, such as the Equality Act, that are addressing this issue. What's been going on in D.C. Uh, as far as in, in Congress uh, with this issue? Well, and so the Equality Act was basically an attempt to push all of this stuff. And so it would elevate gender identity 
um, to the level of uh, sex or race. So the, the U.S. Civil Rights Act in 1964, of course, was designed to make sure that, uh, that black Americans enjoyed legal equality with white Americans. Um, t- so-called Title IX was added in 1972 and 73. That had to do with men and women. So it's really Title IX is the reason that there's so many high school and college girls sports. Um, and so what the Equality Act would do is would say that gender identity is the equivalent of sex so um, and, and race. So it's this kind of immutable characteristic that is protected in civil rights law. It would just literally make the gender ideology the law of the land. I mean, that's the simplest way to think of it. So all the stuff we're talking about would have the status of civil rights law. Fortunately, wow. it's dead. It passed the House, but there are not nearly enough senators. You need two thirds to, to overcome um, the filibuster. And I don't even think it has majority support in the Senate. So the Equality Act itself is is dead at the moment. At least it's not going anywhere. That doesn't mean that the gender ideologues aren't doing things. What they're doing is they're pressing regulations. So the Biden administration has been very busy writing new rules and regulations that would do by by regulatory fiat what they've not been able to do by the legislative process, at least so far. And and how can states respond to the the things that the Biden administration is regulating? Well, this is going to be difficult, but uh, I can tell you that probably the best response so far has been uh, state laws that have gone after the idea of this as a standard of care. So um, our, Arkansas, I'll just give you two examples. Arkansas passed what was called the SAFE Act. So uh, it, to protect kids from, you know, the save American kids from experimentation is what it actually stands for. Um, that basically it, it gives uh, kids and parents what's called a private right of action. That just means the right to sue. It extends a statute of limitation. So if a kid, you know, let's say a kid gets one of these procedures when he's 16 years old, he might not regret it and realize that he was basically abused by the medical system until he's 30. At the moment, statute of limitations on these kinds of things runs out for two years. Well, in in Arkansas, they say basically give people a 20 year window after they turn 18 to be able to sue. Um, and then they, they actually call this uh these kind of procedures out as uh, bad care without making it a felony. They just basically bad care so that they doctors could lose their medical license. So you can see how this changed the incentives that doctors realize, OK, 20 years from now, I might get sued for malpractice and the state might actually go after me and cause me to lose my medical license. That alone is going to completely change the incentives. Uh, Alabama has just passed a law that goes in a different direction. It makes these, quote, gender affirming uh, interventions, class C felonies. That's a different way of, of, of dealing with it. And at the moment, it's not clear which of these is more likely to survive legal challenges. But what we're going to have is basically a legal battle that's going to get set up is happening right now between the federal government under Joe Biden, which is pushing these things down onto states and then states that are resisting. And I would expect it to work its way through the courts. I'm hoping that the political situation changes here at the end of the year and if not at the end of this year in 2025. But it's going to be a major battle. And it's make no mistake, it's a battle over the nature of human beings, whether we exist as male and female. I mean, this is never in history as something so fundamental that everyone takes for granted actually been something that's contested politically but that's exactly what's happening right now yeah and uh, it's not just going to be a a legal and legislative battle but it's also going to be a cultural battle as well jay there there are people who really believe they are not their biological sex due to what's Mm -hmm. being taught and pushed mainstream whether at a young age or at an older age people are shrugging with struggling with their identity and and struggling with gender dysphoria. So my question to you is how can conservatives that have a Judeo-Christian worldview best respond to individuals like Leah Thomas? Because from personal experience, I've been told, Jay, Mm -hmm. that I shouldn't replace my relationship with Christ for my political views. And that some of the things (laughs) that are spoken... Yeah, when, when, you know, when you speak out against... So, for instance, Jay, I'll share this with you. I uh, tweeted out a tweet 
basically that called uh, Leah Thomas a failed male athlete. And so mm-hmm. um, I was told that I should be practicing more grace and less speaking about this issue so I can reach those people. So, Jake, my question to you is, number one, how can we gracefully reach those who disagree with us? And do we have to stay silent while doing it? No, we absolutely cannot stay silent. I mean, there's always this challenge in situations like this of, okay, exactly what does our tone need to be? And I honestly think different people in different positions can take different tones. I've decided, look, I'm I'm going to fight this. I'm going to fight this to the end. I'm, I'm a public policy analyst and a writer and a speaker, and that's what I'm going to do. If someone's a pastor in a church, they are going to obviously need to take a pastoral approach. They may have people in their flock that struggle with this, and then you take the pastoral approach of counseling them. Mm. But it's not pastoral to deny reality. If, pe- if we are made male and female, then denying that is not actually compassionate and it's not pastoral care. You have the, the goal ought always to be to help people to live with reality. And so any kind of good therapy, any kind of good past pastoral counseling is going to help people uh, become comfortable in the body that God gave them. I mean, we would know this if we were talking about bulimia or, or um, anorexia. We would know this, that your job with a, a young woman who is anorexic um, it wouldn't be to encourage her delusional beliefs that she's really obese. It would help. It would be to help her understand that that's not true and that she has a false perception of herself. Um, and it, you know, the gospel is a gospel of truth. And one of the fundamental truths of the faith is that we are created male and female. Now, having said that, it's not just a theological truth. It's not like that's a sectarian idea. Mm-hmm. Every culture and every religion and every time and place has understood that they're males and females because it's just a simple observation of <laughs> of your <laughs> eyes and of reason. But it's also, we also, as Christians, there is a, a theological sort of ratification of that. And you're exactly right. The law is going to be absolutely important for, for, for protecting kids, especially, and protecting parents. But we have, there has to be a religious and a cultural response to this as well, because this is happening both in uh, in the government, it's happening in our laws, and it's also happening in our culture. It's happening in media, and it's certainly happening in social media. So, Jay, uh, I guess this is my final question for you. How does the future look for those of us with a Judeo-Christian or, as you mentioned, biologically accurate view of <laughs> gender and sex? Well, I think there's going to be a fight to be had, but I'm actually really optimistic about this. I think um, if you take the abortion issue, for instance, in 1973 with Roe v. Wade, most Christians hadn't really thought out abortion all that carefully. So there wasn't a pro-life movement in 1973. It's taken us 50 years to get to this point in the U.S. where Roe v. Wade, hope uh, and pray, will finally be overturned. What about the marriage debate? Well, I think the marriage debate is going to be a multi-decade fight where people see the social effects of the dissolution of marriage. I think the gender debate is it's more easily won, and it's because it's so manifestly obvious to people that, that Leah Thomas in many ways is a gift because every person that sees a picture of Leah Thomas knows – He's a male. This is a male. This is an ordinary, you know, sort of athletically built male competing against females in a college sport. And so I think that sort of the testimony of our eyes and of reason uh, is going to help us here. I think parents' intuitions, if you have a child and you've had a child that's 12 years old, you know if that child is a boy or a girl is one of the most basic things that you can know. And so an ideology that forces everyone always to deny what they know most certainly is not an ideology that I think can survive very long. And I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that there's actually an interesting kind of uh, multi, uh, multi-political and multi-partisan uh, alliance that's building. I can tell you I have worked with feminist groups and even with lesbian groups who think biological sex is a real thing. And that's what makes this different from some of the other social issues. And so I'm actually really optimistic. I just think that the the fight here in the next few years is probably going to be tough and it's going to be ugly. Women and children are at risk to lose their safety, security, and equality due to the uh, radical agenda of trans activists. Church, we can't stop praying and we can't stop being involved, educating ourselves and speaking out so we're best equipped to protect the biological and biblical reality of manhood and womanhood. Someone recently said it this way, and I love the way they put it. Womanhood is not puberty blockers. It's not lipstick. It's not clothing. It's not surgery. 
It's a biological reality and should be protected, not redefined. The best women are not men. The best women are women. So, Jay, the audience who wants to get connected, how can they get connected with you and what Heritage Foundation is doing about this? Check us out at heritage.org. You can also just Google The Daily Signal, which is our daily online uh, magazine, and you can follow me in real time at Dr. J. Richards on Twitter. Thank you, Jay, and uh, check out the show notes uh, to links to the content he mentioned. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure.